take your Bible and uh, open the, the Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, please. If you're a guest, we're, our uh, pattern is to preach through a book of the Bible from front to back, and so we are coming down close to the end of this letter that we have called, that is called Ephesians, and uh, so I'm going to read to you the text for today. It's Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 5 to 9, so uh, listen as the Word of God is read regarding this issue of slaves and masters and the Lord Jesus Christ. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. This section, uh, ending at verse 9, concludes a larger section in this letter, the theme of which is authority and submission. It began in chapter 5, verse 22, with wives being called to submit to their husbands. And then last week, we looked at the call to children to obey their parents. And so then today, the call is for slaves to obey their earthly masters. The authority in the homes are addressed as well. So it's not just wives submit, but it's husband, husbands, love your, your wives like Christ loved the church. It's not just children obey, but it's, it's fathers. Uh, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't exasperate them. And then, of course, today, there is a word to the authority, and that's to the masters. Uh, do the same to them, meaning treat them the way you want them to treat you, and stop your threatening, knowing that you have a master as well as they. So in, in these three, three main uh, sections here, in the, uh, three parts to this section of authority and submission, you have husbands and wives, children and parents, and now we have slaves and masters. This section that I'm describing to you has been called the household code. And as we look at husbands and wives and parents and children, we would say, of course, that's about the home. But what we might not necessarily assume is that the word to slaves and masters is also part of the household code. For in the first century, businesses needed workers and that the business was generally a household business so that uh, the address to slaves was an address to these people, men and women, who were part of the larger household that ran a business. Now, I don't know, uh, we don't necessarily have any home businesses where whole families are involved. Uh, If you're a farmer, you might do that, or other kinds of businesses. But uh, this is the general rule uh, in the first century that businesses were generally family-run and required servants. So uh, we tend, when we read this, at least I would initially, I would read this, you know, about working, and I would would impose my 21st century uh, template of work, which is in general, we work, we go to work. Now, I know there's a lot of telecommuting now, but in general, work has been, we get up and we go to work, we leave family behind, and, and 
that's, been the, that's kind of the general rule, at least it has been. Uh, but in this case, that when uh, Paul addresses slaves and masters, he's not talking about what happens outside the home. He's talking about part of the household, thus the household code. One other observation before we dive into the text, and that is these commands, wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters, and husbands to wives, fathers and parents to children, and masters to slaves. Everybody gets a command, at least one. These commands follow on the heels of what we read, what we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. If you would look there, please. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine. That is debauchery. That leads to uh, consequences that you won't care about when you're drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. That's the command. And then we saw the results of being filled with the Spirit. We address one another. Uh, we're addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're singing and we're making melody, melody to the Lord in our hearts. So we're worshiping. The Holy Spirit filling our lives leads Spirit-filled believers to worship. Then we read verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do Spirit-filled people do? They give thanks. They're grateful people. They're not looking at the negative of life. They're giving thanks for all the goodness that God has granted to them and even giving thanks for those things that are difficult because God is at work in them as well. Holy Spirit-filled people give thanks. And then look at verse 21. A third result of being filled with the Spirit is not only worship, not only giving thanks, but submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So if you're asking the question, what frames the, these commands to uh, uh, people in authority, people under authority, in the, in the husband and wife, parent-child, slave-master relationship, if you're asking, what is the framework for that? How, how do we as believers in Jesus, how do we fulfill these commands? The answer is that we do it by the power of the Spirit. This is not something that we do in our own strength. So it is not natural for a wife to just naturally submit to her husband. It's not natural for a husband just to love so sacrificially like Jesus. We, men and women, we're at heart selfish. We want what we want. And so we need the power of the Spirit to obey those commands. And the same with uh, parents to children. Now the, the commands come to this master-servant relationship. And again, the ability to carry out these commands comes from not us digging deep down inside ourselves and somehow we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we do it. No, it's by the power of God, the Spirit of God. And so don't, uh, don't miss that. Don't miss the framework in which these commands are given. We must have the Spirit of God to carry out these commands commands. So with that uh, background in mind, let's look at the issue, the relationships that we have here, the commands to slaves, and, and then of course the command to masters. And it, mixed in with it, I'm going to try with the time that we have to try to address, briefly at least, the whole issue of slavery in the New Testament. And obviously, that's a topic that would take forever if you really, I'm not, I'm not a student of the whole issue of slavery, the first century or in our country. Sadly, it has been a part of our country uh, in the past. Uh, we'll go through this text and we'll do our best to explain it and also bring out some applications that relate to and ex explanations of the New Testament and uh, what the New Testament says about slavery. So, first of all, a little bit of background about first century slavery. 
Uh, it seems to have been universal in the ancient world, and basically it was baked into the culture. It was just baked, it was just part, it was endemic to the whole Roman world. William Barclay writes that, uh, and uh, he's quoting other uh, people who have studied the issue, that their estimates are from where anywhere from 40 to 60 million slaves in first century Roman Empire. Ponder that just for a moment. The prevalence of it. It was just baked into the culture. Mainly, not only, but one of the major causes of slavery was the conquering of peoples. Peoples who were conquered became slaves of the conqueror. <clears throat> slaves had no legal rights, uh, meaning their earthly master could treat him or her as he pleased and there was no legal recourse for them. And the socioeconomic gap between a slave and a master was the size of the Grand Canyon. And any slave that could obtain his or her freedom did it because conditions sometimes uh, were bad. Not in every situation, but often enough that it made uh, slaves want to get their freedom. It, into this sad cultural reality came the gospel of Jesus. Apostle Paul, when he preached, he preached the gospel to anybody that would hear. So masters heard the gospel. Slaves heard the gospel. They heard that if a person would acknowledge their sin, repent of it, put their faith in Jesus who lived for them, died for them, rose again, from the dead for them, they heard the gospel. Slave and master heard the gospel, and God convicted masters and slaves of their sin and opened their heart to the gospel. And so guess what? What I just read to you is unheard of in the Roman world, that slaves are addressed. And these are, these are people. And they are given commands. And so are masters. In other words, in the church, there were slaves and there were masters. And they worshiped together. In fact, they may have even walked to church together. Who knows? In coming to Christ, both slaves and masters now have a new master. Isn't that great? What's his name? the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, I think it's interesting that we, when we read the New Testament, uh, we actually, you know, we don't read things like masters. Immediately, uh, upon hearing this word, free your slaves. I, you, you won't find it. You don't find it in the New Testament. Uh, or do you, do you hear a command to slaves? Slaves, unite, rebel, and run. Here's what the gospel does. The gospel, as we see an address, or see commands to both slaves and masters, acknowledging that there are believing slaves and believing masters, the gospel as the implications of it, as as the, go the gospel, as it's worked out into people's lives, as people come to understand the, the implications of what does it mean to have the same master, whether you're a slave or a slave owner. The gospel subverts slavery. So now, let me give you a, a, an example of that. When you leave today and you walk out to your car, you'll see in the driveway a whole bunch of brown grass, okay? That brown grass has been subverted. Many thanks to whoever sprayed it. Now we just need people to come and whack it away, right? When you walk out there, you realize that somebody some time ago sprayed weed killer on that. The person who did that didn't spray it and go, whoo, it's gone already. Look, it's turning brown before my eyes. It takes time for that chemical to work. But now, if you, when you go out there, you see it, you can say, oh, it's working. 
it got down to the roots and it's killing, it's killing that. Well, we, okay, so every illustration breaks down. We also know that this time next year, <laughs> they'll be back. <laughs> but for now, we, you, you understand what we're saying. Something was put on there that didn't instantly cr do something other than began to subvert, began to desiccate, began to, to poison that which was growing there. And that's exactly how the gospel is intended to work. That the gospel comes into the heart of slave and master and by, and by its, its truth, the truth poisons the demonic institution called slavery. It poisons it from the inside. It guts it. It, it slits it open and pulls out the entrails and guts it. And there's nothing left eventually. And that's how the gospel works against this horrible institution. So no, you do not read that Paul doesn't say, slaves, leave, just now leave. They would die. There, there, there was no place to go. They would be impoverished or dead. There, there wasn't, it was baked in, and this, that would not be the way to end it. If it was, if it would have been the way, God would have written it. It's, it's not the way. And so what do we have here? We have commands. We have commands. Gospel-oriented commands that the slave is to obey and the master is to obey. Let's jump into them. Ready? Verse 5. How are the, how's a slave to obey? It says, with fear and trembling. Now, that's not fear and trembling over a human human master, that's, that's a fear and trembling, a healthy fear, a healthy fear of displeasing their real master, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this is not a trembling or a terror over a God who only looks at us in anger, but it's a reverence and an awe for the majesty, the glory, the purity, the greatness, the power, and the holiness of of the ultimate master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's Paul's logic. Again, look at verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. So if you take out the, the middle uh, phrases and just get the, the main idea, it would be, slaves, obey your earthly masters as you would obey Christ. And so what's happening here is Paul is saying, if Christ were your human master in the flesh, if, if he's the one that was voicing commands today, go get the water, go plow the field, go make that chair in the furniture shop, whatever. If it was actually literally Jesus Christ in the flesh who was your master, would you not obey him and would you not be filled with a reverent fear of how great he is, would you not have a holy fear of displeasing him, or said positively, would you not have a holy desire to please him in the way you work? That's what Paul is telling these slaves. Obey your earthly masters as you would Christ. Now, in this text, you'll see the repeated emphasis of Jesus. Verse 5, obey as you would Christ. Verse 6, you are a bondservant of Christ. Verse 7, render service as to the Lord. Verse 8, you will receive a reward back from the Lord. So what Paul is saying is, Jesus Christ is vitally involved with your work, and more importantly, he is involved with the, what motivates your work. And so, the fear and the trembling has to do with the fact that behind their earthly master stands their heavenly master, who is all glorious and worthy of our reverential awe, and his presence creates humility in our hearts because of the greatness of Jesus. So, come and obey, he says, in fear and trembling. But now notice, not only with fear and trembling, but then notice the next descriptive phrase, with a sincere heart. So now we're getting into the motives part. 
Elsewhere, that same word, which is translated sincere heart, it is translated generous elsewhere in the New Testament. And it's a, a descriptive term to describe the kind of gift somebody would give from their heart to someone in need. They would, they would just, they would make sacrifices, they would do whatever they could do to give a generous gift or sincere gift. That's the idea. A generous gift given genuinely, not just as an outward display or feeling compelled by some outward force, but compelled inwardly to be generous. So what Paul is saying to the slaves is be compelled inwardly to serve as you would obey Jesus. If Jesus were your earthly master, how would that change your attitude about work? Would you work only when he was, he'd be nearby? Or would you, out of love and sincere devotion to him, work diligently to please him, whether he was nearby or at another job site? Again, look at the text. Verse 6, not by way of eye service, right? That's what Mike was referring to uh, after he read the Old Testament passage about uh, indentured servit servitude. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So Paul is warning the slaves about being eye servants. Now we've all, you know, We've all been there at the job where uh, the boss isn't there and all of a sudden he or she is there and somebody says, hey, look busy, the boss is coming. That is, that's what Paul is addressing here. Don't be eye servants. Don't serve your bosses or your master's eye. Don't just put on a, an outward show when he or she is there. That's, that's not the kind of service that honors Christ. Don't give eye service, give heart service, you see? Sincere heart service. Uh, from the heart, serving. Uh, it's a heart motivation issue. When I think about serving this, serving as a, you know, just when the boss is there, I, th I think of how we, how we drive. Now, I'm going to include myself, okay? <laughs> You're driving along, and that, you know, the needle is just going a little bit more, and it's like, oh, I probably shouldn't go this fast. And then all of a sudden, as you're passing by some mound of dirt or a big bush, you look and you go, oh, I'm toast. And there's a policeman there. And so suddenly, why, why do we have that response? Because we know that we could be being watched. See. So we, we sometimes, okay, sometimes we drive the way Paul's saying people work. We obey when we think we're being watched, but otherwise it's like pedal to the metal. See, whenever you, you can kind of tell when there's a, a speed trap somewhere because you see the brake lights come on. And then, and then the people speed up. And then when they're out of sight, then it's like back to, you know, 80 miles an hour. That's called Police pleasing. Paul is addressing eye service, eye please, uh, master pleasing in the sense of just an outward act. Here, here's what we forget. We forget that all of life is quorum deo, a Latin phrase that means before the face of God. All of life is lived before the face of God. God doesn't, like, have little, uh, you know, um, uh, circuits that he runs where he touches base with everybody now and then. He is everywhere present and aware of everything all at once. That's why sometimes when we don't preach through a book of the Bible, we take time to look at that character of God because God is so awesome. So, a slave who works only for what his master can see rather than for what his heavenly master can see is, in the words of Jesus, a hypocrite. 
That's a condition where we could care less about what is going on inside our heart and where our only concern is how we look. And Paul is saying, servants, slaves, you matter. What you do matters. What you do matters to God. And so I don't want you to serve uh, your master uh, outwardly. I want things, go the, the Spirit of God wants things going on inside your heart that are obedient. Don't be a hypocrite. And so at this point, this is where Paul would say, you know, I think I addressed this issue in chapter 4, verse 22. If you want to just uh, turn your attention just to that verse where Paul says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So put off eye service. Put off that attitude of, you know, just when the boss is around. Uh, put off that. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, think about what's motivating you and then put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, uh, build new habits. Habits where your work is, is your work whether you're being watched or not because you know that God, God's involved. God cares about uh, your work. Someone has quipped, maybe you've heard this before, the only time people work like a horse is when the boss is riding them. And I want to tell you, your ultimate boss, Jesus, does not ride you. He walks alongside you. He strengthens you. He helps you. He encourages. He guides. He fills your heart with joy as you serve your employer, as these slaves serve their master. And so we, as these slaves, were commanded to uh, obey their masters with, first of all, fear and trembling. Secondly, with a sincere heart, a real motivation, not an outward motive, an inward motivation. And thirdly, they were to serve as bond servants of Christ. Look at verse 6. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants or bond servants of Christ. So this is your new identity. To a slave, this is what they would hear. They would be hearing, oh, I have a new owner. I was just called a bond slave of Christ. Here, I thought so-and-so bought me way back when. I became his property, sadly, right? But now the, the slave hears, wait, I have a new master? I, 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 I've been bought out by somebody else? Yeah, yes. When you came to Christ, you got a new master. He bought you with his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Uh, Paul said to the Corinthians, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a master according to the flesh. But in addition, you have an ultimate master for whom you work. And there's generally no contradiction between the two. But if there is, because your human master or whatever we want to call this person is, is trying to command you to do something wrong, like cook the books or something like that, or uh, do something that's unethical at your job, you have to remember that you have an ultimate master who, whom you would have to obey. But in general, there, there isn't a conflict between the two. But if there is, you need to uh, serve God rather than men. And the work that you actually do is done for Jesus. My former pastor, uh, church I served before, commented on this verse, and he puts it this way. He says, if we clean houses, then we make the floors shine because Jesus Christ is worthy of a shiny floor. See, we're... we're bond servants of Jesus. So what, what kind of quality would Jesus want for floors? He would, if we're cleaning them, he would want a shiny floor. If we paint buildings, then let's give all the coats necessary to make it last. Jesus is worthy of that kind of work. If we preach, we proclaim God's truth with the knowledge that Jesus Christ is among the audience listening to the sermon. Yep, every Sunday that I finish or before I start, 
uh, as I prepare, sometimes when it, I'm all finished, and uh, I'll walk back to my, my home and I'll say, okay, Lord, I, I've done my best. I'm going to give you my best uh, because I know you're going to be there. <laughs> He's going to be there the next day if it's, if it's you know, f- finished the day before. He's going to be there. So uh, if we teach, what, it's just whatever it may be, if we do it in keeping in mind that Jesus is in the classroom, if we build homes, we do it right because we're building it for Jesus Christ. If we sell things, we keep in mind that Jesus is Lord, Lord even of our sales pitch. We serve the Lord through our work. In the book Perilous Pursuits, there's a story about Dr. Howard Hendricks. Perhaps you heard the story before. Uh, Howard Hendricks uh, was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary and a very uh, sought-after conference speaker. So he traveled a lot. He's on, he was on airplanes a lot. And he tells the story of being on a jet plane that sat on the hot tarmac at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. If you've ever been there, you know how hot it can be. And the plane sat on the tarmac for three hours before it could take off. And as the temperature inside the cabin began to climb, so did the passengers' tempers heat up. And Dr. Hendricks says he was particularly impressed with one flight attendant who, with unusual calmness and grace, fielded complaints, patiently endured angry looks, and and endured barbed comments. You can imagine what she must have heard. So the plane finally took off and got to its destination and landed, and as Hendricks left the plane, he introduced himself to this flight attendant, and he said, could I have your name? He, he told her his, his name. He said, could I have your name? I want to write a note to your boss at American Airlines commending your great service and your attitude. And her response was, that's very kind of you, sir. I appreciate it very much, but uh, I don't really work for American Airlines. I'm serving the Lord. And so that is is what it means that you have a new identity. You are a bondservant of the Lord. You serve Him. Okay? So, how should slaves obey? With fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, living out their new identity as bondservants. And then look at verse 7. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, not to man. With, with a good will. This is with enthusiasm. If you look up the word in the Greek dictionary, it means with eagerness, enthusiasm, with a whole heart. In other words, you're not half in and half out. You're all in. That's the idea. That's how you, that's how you serve. That's how you obey. You, you serve with enthusiasm. Like 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Or Ecclesiastes. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Uh, The same pastor that I referenced before writes this. It is very difficult to believe that God has you spending a third of your life, think about it, think about how much of your life, your adult life is taken up working. It's got to be close to a third. A third of your life on something which isn't important to him. Think about it. It's hard to believe that God has you spending a third of your life on something which isn't important to him. So maybe you are a chemist. That's God's job. You may be his chemist, his journalist, his administrator, his draftsman, his engineer, his salesperson, his lawyer, his painter. You be his carpenter, his real estate agent, his social worker, his forklift driver, his landscaping agent. The important thing to remember is that the work you're doing, if it isn't sinful, it's God's work, it's God's will, And therefore, do it wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Apathy is a huge problem everywhere. I I heard the story. I can't tell you whether it's true or not, but I can tell you it really fits. (laughs) There were two teen boys that were told they had to stay after class. And the teacher said to them, I've written a word on the board. That I, if you don't know what it means, I want you to look it up. And 
you talk about it while I leave for a few minutes. And so the teacher left, and they looked at each other, and they snickered, and they that little, you know, kind of made fun of it. And then they looked at the board, and one of them started squinting and looking, and he started to spell it. And he said, Who? I don't know what it means. Who cares? There's often a high degree of apathy at work. A true story, right out of the, the paper, I actually knew the, the supervisor, the PennDOT supervisor. Now, this is not a put down any PennDOT. Okay, I know there's jokes, but this is, I'm not doing that. Many years ago, in the summer of 1996, a supervisor for PennDOT had to admit to the media that one of his paving crew did some sloppy work. Now, I am literally quoting from the paper. The supervisor said, yes, the operator should have seen the deer, and yes, it should have been removed. He was referring to the incident where one of his paving crews paved over a dead deer. So uh, apathy, don't let that happen. Paul is saying, slaves, do it with a good will. Do it with a good will, uh, enthusiastically, eagerly, a whole heart. That's what, that's what the Lord deserves. God is too majestic for an apathetic worker, an apathetic slave in, in this context. So we do our work in fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as bond servants. That's our new identity. We do it with enthusiasm. And then verse 8, we do it with expectation. Verse 8 says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And now, as you read that, you can begin, if you're looking, you can begin to see a few cracks coming, right? Because now, you begin to see that he's addressing both about the same issue, a reward. And he's saying, yo, slaves, yo, masters, guess what? You have the same master. And he will reward good work. He will reward it. So whether or not your earthly master rewards you for your good work, remember, nothing escapes the omniscient, omnipresent awareness of your heavenly master. And he doesn't just see what you do. He's, in, he's, he's, he's in, interested in that. But he's so much more interested not only in what we do, but what motivates what we do. You see, your boss, or in this case, the master, he might not be able to detect the actual motive. But our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, God sees into the heart, knows why, knows, he knows what's going on. Nothing escapes. He knows what others don't know. He knows about your efforts. He knows he, you know, your boss or your, the, the master may not have understood the challenge that something was for you. But guess what? Your heavenly master, oh, he's already, he's all over it. He's, he's all aware of it. And, and it may have gone under your boss's radar, but it didn't, it didn't get past Jesus. He knows the efforts that you've put into your labor. He, he's going to reward you either in this life and if not now, surely in glory. I can tell you that a few words from your heavenly master, well done, good and faithful servant. I can tell you that those words from the almighty, glorious, pure and holy, majestic, awesome Jesus, few words from him will be far more meaningful to you 
than a million dollar bonus and season tickets at the 50 yard line or behind home plate. Those words from Jesus will mean everything because he will reward. And so, friends, Jesus Christ is not going to settle for mere outward obedience, as important as that is. He's looking for whole souled, sincere, good willed, enthusiastic work done, first of all, for him and for your master or boss. That's the word to slaves. And then the word to masters, it's just, you know, very brief. One verse, master, verse 9, masters. Here it is. Remember what I just said to your slaves? Remember what I just told them to do? Look at verse 9. Do the same to them. He's just, he's like, copy and paste. Same thing. Respect, fairness, justice. Work alongside them. See what it's like when you ask them, what's it like? Be aware. Put yourself in their shoes. Golden rule, straight up. Do to them as, uh, as you would have them do to you. That's what he means. You expect your employees to work? Then you need to work with them and, in a sense, serve them. Cease, and then he does give uh, the command, stop your threatening, cease and desist threatening. You know, threats of bodily injury are not Jesus' way of motivating. He's not, you know, breaking their arm or, uh, you know, doing, if you've read, if you've read Roots, you understand how slaves in America were treated. Uh, that, that's, the whole thing is just demonic, the whole system. He says, notice, the end of verse 9, knowing, okay, what do you know? That he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. I told you earlier that the socioeconomic gap between a master and a slave was the size of the Grand Canyon. But by the grace of Christ and the gospel in the church, that gap is, is a non-existent gap. That doesn't mean the slave is no longer a slave or the master is no longer a master. It just means that in God's eyes, God doesn't say, ah, I favor the master. Or, nor does he say, ha, huh, I favor the slave. It says he's impartial. There's no partiality with him. What is he asking for? He's asking for holiness. He's asking for obedience from the heart. He's asking for love and worship to Christ from both. And as they work to, together, they're, they're uh, serving together for the glory of God. So there's no favored status. The Lord Jesus sees people as people, regardless of their ethnicity, their education, uh, where they live, where they work. None of that means, see, that means everything in our culture. It doesn't mean anything to our heavenly master. He sees people for who they are, and he expects responsible living from both. There's no excuses here for say, ah, I know it's tough, you know, ah, uh, you know, give you a pass. No. He, the, the, in fact, the, the bulk of the information here in our text today is geared toward the, the folks that are like in the trenches. You see what he's doing. He, he's, you're a person. You have responsibilities. Fulfill them. Slave. You, you're a person. You have responsibilities. Fulfill them. No favorites. No favorites. Take responsibility. Work. Take responsibility. Serve the people you work to the masters. So, I said earlier that you're not going to find an outright categorical condemnation of slavery in the New Testament. But what you will find is a categorical, outright condemnation of slave trade. 
So you don't have to, well, you could turn there. Uh, we're out of time. 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 11. I'll just read it to you. I want you to hear this. There's, there are, there's a couple verses that if, if two verses in the Bible, just two, were taken seriously, we would not have the, the blight on our U.S. history. Listen to first the New Testament word and then the Old Testament. 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 11. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. Okay, so that's the kind of people uh, Paul is addressing there. And now he begins to list the kind of things that make them such. He says, for those who strike their fathers and mothers. Okay, so either they murder them or they maim them. This is the kind of people that the law is made for. for. For those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality. And the next word in the list is, are you ready for this? Enslavers. Enslavers. And then it goes on, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. That is an outright condemnation of slave trade. And if that one verse were taken seriously, for the life of me, I cannot understand how that, that verse did not stop the slave trade in its tracks in America. But it, had it been obeyed, there wouldn't have been slavery, or at least not to any degree that it was. The Old Testament has a similar condemnation, Exodus 21, 16. So again, you might want to jot the reference down, but here it is, Exodus 21, verse 16. People erroneously say, um, oh, the Bible supports slavery. Okay, well then, what does Exodus 21, 16? Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Is that clear or what? The Bible outright condemns the very source of slavery. You know, I, one of the most wonderful New Testament letters is this little postage stamp size letter called Philemon. <clears throat> <clears throat> the whole letter is about the Apostle Paul wanting to return to Philemon, one of his runaway slaves. The runaway slave is named Onesimus. Onesimus broke loose somehow. He was caught, he was in jail, and he, in the providence of God, met the Apostle Paul, who was also in jail at that time. The Apostle Paul shared the gospel with Onesimus, the runaway slave, and Onesimus repented and put his faith in Jesus. So now... He has a fellow Christian who is a runaway slave next to him, and he finds out who his owner is, Philemon. And he writes a letter. That letter made its way into the Bible. And the letter is, was carried by the hand of the slave, the runaway slave. In the letter it said, Dear Philemon, would you please receive back Onesimus no longer as a slave, but more than that, as a dear, beloved brother. And then the next verse he says, receive him as you would receive me. And so when you think about what Paul wrote there and how the Holy Spirit, I mean, it was just a, you know, a 20 verse letter, one chapter, and it made its way into the New Testament why do you think it made its way? Because what, what the Lord is saying there is that the gospel speaks to slavery by showing that whether we are slave or free, in Christ, we're equal. We are brothers. We are part of the same spiritual temple that's being built to house 
the presence of God by His Spirit. We're part of the same spiritual family. We receive the same promises from God. We have the same inheritance. We have access to the same Heavenly Father. There is complete, there, there, like in Galatians 3.28, in the, in the kingdom of God, there is, there is neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave or free. What are we? We are one in Christ. Paul isn't saying, oh, you mean there's no more gender? There's no more ethnicity? No, he's not saying that. He's saying those things don't matter when it comes to the unity of the body. Surely there are roles for men and women. We get that. You don't stop being a Jew or a Gentile just because you come to Christ. But those different divisions don't divide people in the church. We are one in Christ. Over and over again, you read in the Bible where God says, I'm, I'm bringing people together. I'm reconciling Jew and Gentile. I, slave and master coming together in the church. And I am using that unity that I create, God creates, to teach the, the heavenly powers about my wisdom. And so, uh, in doing that, in making masters and slaves spiritual equals, what God is doing is he's spraying the spiritual weed killer on the demonic weed of slavery. And if it's applied, if the gospel is lived out, it dries up slavery from the inside out, it desiccates it, it guts it, and it can just blow away. That's the idea of it. So the gospel makes slaves and masters equals, brothers, fellow heirs of salvation through Christ. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for the work that you do through the gospel. We surely admit the puzzle uh, of the entire message of the Bible uh, that we sometimes wonder why you didn't just outright uh, denounce the whole institution and tell masters to free their slaves. There are lots of unanswered questions, Lord, and yet we can see. We can see the logic of it. We can see the wisdom of it. And Lord, help us to live out the gospel daily in our families, uh, in all our relationships. Uh, so that the power of Christ is seen and the glory of Christ is seen and people will be drawn to him. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.